Good morning. For all of those of you who uh, wonder if after we cancel service for a week, if the pastor preaches twice as long the next week, we don't know the answer to the question yet, so we'll find out. Glad you're here today. I'm glad the, the weather, uh, everyone stayed safe last week. And I hope our systems really served you well in being able to communicate uh, when we had to cancel an event like that. This morning, we are uh, continuing on in our series uh, called uh, The Why Factor. And uh, in the first message, one of the things that we talked about is why are we here? And we discovered that we've been created to be in relationship with God and with others, to exercise authority, that we're not just a product of the forces that are around us, and to take something good and make it better. And we discovered the second week that we really can't do that in isolation. It requires community. Today, I want to talk about why would we want to consider sharing our faith with someone else? Why would we want to do that? It's a great passage of scripture in 1 Peter chapter 3 that really helps us uh, unpack this. It says, who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. So, we are here to be in relationship with God and with others, and part of our responsibility is to share our faith with someone else. The truth is, we need to understand why that's an important thing. And here's what I want you to understand. Why should we share our faith? Because there isn't anyone God doesn't love. You've never laid eyes on a person that God doesn't love. You've laid eyes on people you don't love, but God loves them. And the challenge is they don't know that yet. So we have a responsibility. Now, there are actually lots of reasons not to share our faith with someone. For example, we might be worried that if we bring up a spiritual conversation, it could alter the relationship that already exists. We might be worried that we won't have answers to some of the challenging questions that they would ask. We might assume, or they might assume things about us that aren't true. They'll look at us and go, oh, you're one of them, one of those people. Uh, we might be offended by their behavior, and by their actions, and by their language. And so we don't want to get too close or too connected. We might be intimidated because maybe they're really smart or very well resourced. Or maybe they just have a super strong personality. Uh, maybe you don't want to share your faith because you feel like you're an inadequate representation of what a Christian is supposed to be. Maybe we just don't know how to share our faith. There are lots of reasons not to. But we're still called to. So I'd like to challenge us on three assumptions we should never make and two assumptions we should always make today. And the first is this. Don't assume that you can only effectively share your faith if everything in your life is going well. You know, like, you're doing fine physically, you're doing fine emotionally, you're doing fine spiritually, your relationships in your family are good, your kids are well behaved, you've got enough money, everything's good, now I can share my faith. Uh, that's going to limit the number of people significantly. Peter actually addresses this uh, in, in the passage. Uh, this is what he says, even if you suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Now, he's not saying that blessing equals suffering, that in fact uh, there's a whole stream of religious pursuit called asceticism where you inflict pain upon yourself because you believe it could cause some kind of spiritual benefit. That, that's not what he's saying, and that's not a healthy approach to our spirituality. What he's saying is when you're going through difficult things, don't make the assumption that because my circumstances are bad, I must be bad or something is wrong in my relationship with God. We will be very unlikely to share our faith if we assume that God is punishing us because we didn't live up to some expectation. So don't assume 
that uh, you can only effectively share your faith if your life is going well. Secondly, don't assume that people are not interested. People are interested. Um, you can watch people's behavior and make quite a few assumptions about them. And uh, in, in religious world, a lot of the assumptions that uh, can be made uh, are that people act the way they act because they are defiant and rebellious against God. The, the church and, and uh, uh, scripture actually teaches a set of values that helps us to be able to live together in harmony, that we're committed to truth-telling, that the deepest levels of intimacy should be reserved for the highest levels of commitment, that all of these things are values. And then we're, we live in a culture where a lot of that stuff gets violated. And so we, it's very easy to look at people who are living differently and go, they, they just, they got a fist in the face of God. And they're, they're angry with God. And actually, most of the time, that's not true. Uh, a lot of times, people just worry about what others think, and they're doing things because their peers expect it of them. And they don't know how to manage that. Sometimes they're trying to medicate fear and pain in their lives. And so they're exercising options that aren't healthy, but it's the only way they feel like they can stay in some kind of control. Or maybe they're just trying to get something that they don't think they would ever qualify for in life unless they cut some kind of corner. And here's, here's the thing you don't usually hear in rooms like this. There are people who make bad choices for good reasons. They're not being defiant against God. They're not being rebellious. They're afraid. They're trying to live up to other people's expectations. And so a lot of times people can make bad choices for good reasons. But please hear me. That doesn't make the choices good. Just because you have a good reason doesn't make the choices a good choice. And so when we talk to people, we assume that they're not interested because we observe things about their behavior and we assume they have an attitude of defiance towards God. And in fact, none of that may be going on. People are actually very interested in spiritual things. I've been doing ministry a long time. And what I will tell you is there is more interest in God and in spiritual things right now in our culture than I have seen in my entire lifetime. People are not disinterested. People want to know more about who God is and how he interacts with people. They want their life to work. They want their love to be returned. They want their kids to do well. They want to learn to be more generous. And a lot of times, they just assume that God is a taker rather than a giver. And it makes them anxious. And quite honestly, a lot of the fault of that lies with my profession because a lot of times my profession indicates to people that God is taking something or someone from them. And that is not helpful and it's not healthy. And so we have to find a different approach to these things. So Peter says that people ask you questions and they will ask you questions based on things that they are observing in your life. Now, a lot of times we assume this is just behavioral. And I actually think it has a lot less to do with behavior and a lot more to do with attitude. Uh, for example, I am part of a fellowship of churches that in order to be credentialed in, uh, alcoholic beverages are something that I am required to abstain from. I spend a lot of time in restaurants and my beverage of choice is a diet cola product. I've never had one person in all the years I've been in a restaurant come up to me and say, I couldn't help but notice you are drinking a diet cola product. What must I do to be saved? <laughs> never happened. It has not happened and I actually don't expect it to happen. It's not what people notice. What people notice is attitudinal things. Why are you more hopeful than other people? Why do you seem to have a quiet confidence even when the temperature of stress around you starts to rise? Why are you such a generous person? Aren't you afraid you're going to run out? How are you able to be honest even when it means you're going to be embarrassed? How do you find the courage to do something when I know you're afraid and you do it anyway? How do you manage to keep your commitments when I know it's costing you more and taking more of your time than you thought it was going to? 
when they see those kinds of things, they will ask questions and they will never make the assumption that those attitudes are connected to a spiritual reality. And that is our opportunity to be able to share something about the goodness and the graciousness of God. So don't assume that people are not interested. And thirdly, don't assume you don't have good reasons. Don't assume you don't have good reasons. A lot of people feel like if you're going to share your faith, you must be a master theologian who's able to answer the most complex and complicated questions anyone could ask related to theology or life in general. And what I will tell you is you'll never answer any questions. Some questions that people throw out at you are just smoke screens. That's all they are. I had lunch with a person one time who the reason they got together with me for lunch was they were going to smoke screen me into a position where I would leave them alone. And so their question was this, what about a person who lives in a third world nation on a mountain and is in an isolated community, has never heard the gospel and doesn't speak English and doesn't read or write and nobody ever told him, what is God going to do with them? And I said, well, I said, I don't know. But you have heard, and you can read, and you can write, so what are you going to do with God? And uh, that person attends our church every Sunday and has made a, a commitment in faith to Christ. We don't have to have all these. Let's just try this, all right? Everybody, let's just try three simple words, all right? I don't know. Let's try it. I don't Legitimate answer to a question, especially when you don't know. Don't make something up, right? Um, we make responses to questions about why we believe far more complicated than they need to be. So let's just do a little uh, disclosure thing this morning. Uh, is there anybody in the room who happens to be a member of Amazon Prime? Yeah. So let, let me just ask, why are you a member of Amazon Prime? Free shipping, okay? Anything else? Movies, all right? Anything else? Books, music. Yeah, free shipping, right? No shipping would not be a good thing, but <laughs> free shipping, that's good. Yeah. Start a business. Yeah, we won't send it to you. Or how about this? Anybody here a subscriber to Apple Music? Great. Why, why would you do that? Well, maybe because... For the cost of one CD a month, you get almost all the music that was ever made. Or how about Netflix? Do we have any Netflix subscribers around here? Yeah. Why do you subscribe to Netflix? <laughs> Commercial free? What is it? The Office? <laughs> it's very good. All right, The Office. Um, so we, you all have reasons. If I were to ask you, so how does Amazon actually get a package to you in less than 48 hours and not charge you for the shipping, you wouldn't know how they do it. But you like that they do. And here's our problem. When people ask for the reasons of the hope that we have, we're trying to give someone else's reasons and doctrinal responses. What are the reasons for the hope that you have? Maybe you, did, maybe you were a person, I did some research on religion, and what I discovered is, is Christianity really is quite different. Or maybe I just was living a life where nothing seemed to matter, and when I met Jesus, I found meaning. Or maybe uh, when I became part of a local church, I had a sense of belonging, and that was really important to me. Or maybe uh, my relationships were falling apart and God was able to bring healing to those. Or maybe it's a physical thing, you know. People prayed for me, and they supported me, and my body recovered and got better. Or maybe grace is changing my life in ways I couldn't possibly have imagined or calculated. Or maybe I got tired of trying to earn every single thing in my life. And when I discovered that God was a giver and that he gives grace freely, it changed me. Or maybe just I discovered how generous God was. Or I've discovered that as I pursue this life of faith, I'm getting braver on the inside or I'm feeling stronger in my capacity or hope has returned to my life. And all of those, all of those are good reasons. Give the reason 
for the hope that you have. You know why you belong to Amazon Prime. You know why you subscribe to Apple Music. You know why that you are a subscriber to Netflix. Do you know why you are a follower of Jesus? And we keep turning it into a doctrinal argument instead of the real reason you have hope. Give that reason. It's very, very powerful. So, uh, two assumptions I would like you to make, and that is God is making appointments. It's amazing how often we assume that life is just a series of accidents and uh, conse- or, uh, uh, circumstances. What if God was placing you in the exact right place at the exact right time to be able to have a conversation that really matters? What's true is that a lot of times people in church world spend a lot of their time trying to avoid people who are not in church world. And Jesus thought very differently about this. He actually made an intentional effort to connect with people who were not religious in society, who didn't have high opinions about God or his values. And by the way, this is the fascinating thing to me. The most disconnected in terms of values and belief in society were the most attracted to Jesus. The holiest man who ever lived was the most comfortable person to be with when you were farthest from God. That is such a powerful truth that I've actually come to believe that if the way we live our life in holiness is making uncommitted, unbelieving people uncomfortable, we're doing holy wrong. There's a disconnect We need to find a way to think differently about the people who are around us. Jesus was highly criticized for spending time with people who didn't buy into the whole religious system. But he made a huge impact in their lives. They wanted to be around him. They learned a lot from him, and they changed their opinion of him because of that. Now, there are lots of people who are never going to walk into rooms like this. Lots of people woke up this morning in time to make one of our services, and the thought never occurred, you know, I think I'm, I'm, I'm feeling a, a, a craving for, I don't know, religion. And uh, let's just go find out. It doesn't matter where. We'll, we'll just find a building. We'll go sit and see what we find out. Nobody thinks like that. By the way, people who aren't believers, they're not surfing the web Googling Pastor Bob messages. It's not part of anything they would ordinarily even think of. So how are they going to be connected to the grace of God? And the answer is because God has strategically put you in their life. And now there's an opportunity for a conversation that wouldn't have happened any other way. And And Peter says this. This is really cool. He says, so when you are giving your confident responses, do it with gentleness and respect. Gentleness and respect. These are words that, uh, well, I can't say the church has owned these values really well, and I will tell you that our culture doesn't either. But gentleness and respect. No one wants to be disrespected. You can't trash talk someone into the kingdom of God. You don't lift people up by putting them down. You don't have to be rude to be confident. You can be confident that God is actually providing you opportunities to partner with him in a work that actually matters. You can be confident in God's ability to help you reach someone else. You can be confident that he's at work right now. What if these aren't accidental meetings? What if they're part of God's divine appointments? Respectful. Gentle. Last assumption we should make. People appreciate gracious invitations. They like to be welcomed and invited to things. Uh, You might just say to someone, Maybe you'd like to check out. Maybe you've had a conversation and they've demonstrated an interest in spiritual things. Maybe, maybe you'd like to check out a worship space. You'd be more than welcome to join ours. Or our kids' ministry is amazing. Our kids love it. Maybe your kids would like it too. Or our pastor's actually going to talk about the topic that we were just talking about. Maybe you'd be interested in hearing that. Or maybe the pastor already talked about that and this is how you can access that online Maybe you'd find it interesting. Now, here's the challenge. 
in all of this. Lots of us will assume this is not our responsibility. This is the responsibility of the paid staff and volunteer leadership, and the rest of us just kind of attend. And Peter addresses this too. This is what he says. In your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. The question is, who has the right to call the shots in your life? Are your decisions going to be made on just your comfort or what you're anxious about or who you're intimidated about talking to or any of those things? Or do you feel that Jesus really does have the right to say, I strategically located you at this time in this place with this person so that a connection of grace might happen? Do we have that perspective? There is not a single person you will ever lay eyes, eyes on that God doesn't love. He cannot imagine eternity without them. And he's paid the most astonishing price for them. Are our fears and our opinions going to make our decisions, or are we going to revere Christ as Lord in our hearts? Forgiveness could be one conversation away. I don't know anybody who thinks they're perfect. That's the first step, just to acknowledge that. And while we have improved ourselves, it is also truth that we can't close the gap between us and God by our own efforts. And we decide to trust that that gap has been closed by him through the work of his son. And the moment you trust that, eternal life starts flowing into you. And between now and the day that we're with him in heaven forever, he promises to be with us right now to lead and to guide us. It's the most wonderful news to share in all the world. Let's bow our heads this morning. Uh, this really isn't about, you know, if you have an outgoing personality or if you're an extrovert or how long you've been a believer or how much scripture you've memorized. Um, it's about you having thought through. This is why I followed the one who loved me more than I could have imagined and has done for, far more for me than I could have deserved. And he's got a purpose in my life that, well, it's the one that's worth living. And until we learn this truth, until we live this truth, we'll always feel less. It doesn't make you bad. You just feel less. You'll, you'll lay on a bed at night and you'll think about the conversation you could have had. And what I want you to know is that never has to happen. You don't always have to get it right. You just have to be willing to speak up with respect and gentleness. This is why I follow Jesus. And I'm telling you, I am telling you, our world is desperate to hear that. Father, thank you for unbelievable levels of grace and the astonishing price you paid to make it available to us. Today we choose to review, revere you as Lord in our hearts and we are looking for the opportunities that you create to share what you have done. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you all stand with me this morning?